Felix Lehr here for Thomann Synthesizers and today I'm going to be showing you some ways uh, in which I make pretty much all of my sounds more warm and organic. Uh, but before I tackle this issue I first have to address the obvious elephant in the room which is the fact that all of these terms such as vintage and analog warmth pretty much have become marketing buzzwords at this point slapped onto all sorts of products. But what I'm going to argue is that much more important than any one piece of gear or software is to actually uh, have a more nuanced understanding of how these desirable sound characteristics uh, actually come to be and what are the mechanisms that drive them. So uh, only once we understand these we're going to be able to judge whether what we need actually is another piece of gear or software or if maybe we actually already have everything that we need. So long story short I'm going to go through some of these principles using hardware and software uh, and obviously this is not going to be a comprehensive list but just some of my personal favorites so let's get into it. All right, so here we are inside of my Ableton to show you uh, how far we can actually already get without using any analog hardware whatsoever. Um, first, I'm going to show you my number one favorite plugin, which is RC20 Retro Color, um, which is beautiful. You don't have to use this one, obviously, but it's uh, super, super handy because it packs a lot of these um, vintage sound artifacts of old machines and old technology and puts it into one uh, very practical plugin which is also perfect for demonstrating all of these principles and we're going to start out with just a basic sine wave which is basically the least exciting most mathematically accurate lame sound as you can see here the pitch is perfectly stable and the spectrum only has uh, one fundamental frequency with no harmonics whatsoever. So one thing that a lot of vintage old analog equipment is going to do in any case is to distort the sound even if it's just very very subtly just adding very subtle saturation. So now listen what saturation or distortion actually does it adds harmonics to our sine wave once I start to distort it. You can see on the spectrum it's almost like additional notes appear. Um, that's what we call harmonics and distortion is nothing but yeah, adding harmonics. This is obviously very drastic and what a lot of gear would do, even if you don't want to distort with it, it would add tiny, tiny amounts of subtle saturation as you can see down here. And the great thing about RC20 is with this uh, yeah, adjustment here, it lets us uh, affect the fluctuation. So. If I pull this all the way up, the distortion is actually gonna fluctuate and change over time. And um, this is also something that's gonna make your sound much more organic. If there's a lot of stuff happening all the time that's fluctuating, even if it's just in a super subtle way that you don't even notice. Because if there's like 200 things in your track that you don't notice, uh, but they all add tiny, tiny bits of fluctuation, Beautiful, gonna make a huge difference in the end. Um, so up next, take care of the pitch of the sine wave now here on the tuner, because the next effect I'm gonna add in is wobble, which is inspired by the behavior of magnetic tape, um, which wouldn't just run perfectly smooth, but it actually would have tiny fluctuations in tempo called wow and flutter. Wow would be like the uh, more subtle, um, slower fluctuation in the speed of the tape and flutter would actually be this kind of behavior of the tape and we can simulate both with this. Let's first start just with wow and look what it does to the tuner down here. And this is not just an LFO that's going at a perfectly steady rate but here again we can add this fluctuation for the fluctuation uh, of the modulation basically. This is obviously a very extreme setting now, but you can see it's unpredictable. And now we can add in some flutter as well, but only very subtly, as though the tape was moving like this. Very subtle. And here also, add some fluctuation to it. Bam. Up next, also inspired by the behavior of magnetic tape, is this section here, which uh, you first have to understand how magnetic tape works. 
there's magnetic powder on a plastic stripe uh, which is magnetized by electricity and that's the signal. Uh, but what can happen and will happen over time is that some of this powder on the tape is going to fall off. Um, and this is going to um, create some tiny fluctuations in volume of the signal. Uh, because um, the fewer powder there is on the uh, stripe of plastic, the uh, yeah, quieter the sound is going to be. And here also a very drastic setting for you. It's basically never going to sound like this, it's just for demonstration. But something like this. It's actually more realistic. And obviously this all sounds boring on a sine wave, but, but we're going to get to some real sounds in a minute. Just let's first um, also listen to the noise section here, which is really beautiful because it lets you add vinyl noise and tape hiss uh, to your liking. Let's just have a quick listen to the vinyl noises, number one and number two and tape hiss at a tape speed of 7.5 inches per second and tape hiss at 15 inches a second and here also we can have fluctuations and interaction with the incoming signal through these parameters and all right enough of the sine wave let's get into some actual sounds like for example this beautiful a drum loop that my friend Leon recorded for me, which in its dry state sounds something like this. Which is lovely, but it's also a bit boring production wise because it's super contemporary and dry and there's not any specific aesthetic baked into it yet. And what I'm gonna do now is basically just an example of how you could approach sound design. The uh, final result that I'm going for is um, I want to use it like a breakbeat sample from the 70s and I want to process it in a way uh, that you would find it on like a 90s trip-hop production, sort of like Portis Head or Massive Attack, something like this. Um, and now we have this dry clean signal here and um, what helps a lot is to actually think about if you hear a sound in a record and you like it, what journey did this sound actually go through until it uh, yeah, landed on that record in that way? And um, if it was a 90s trip hop track, it would likely have been a breakbeat sample from the 70s. And once that went through a microphone, it would likely have went into a microphone preamp for which I'm going to use this radiator here by Sound Toys. All of the Sound Toys stuff is really lovely, which is going to just add some tiny, tiny saturation here. Once I turn in the in, uh, up the input, this is a more drastic setting, but I want to have this needle move nice and smoothly. Bam! First, tiny, tiny bit of saturation, and this is actually also a simulation of one of these '70s preamps, but any saturation would do basically. Um, up next, what would happen? It would go into a console and in this console, like a mixing desk, it would probably distort a tiny bit more, but in a different way. So here just another saturation uh, distortion plugin. This is the, just the distorted signal. And we're gonna mix it in very subtly, like five or 10%. All right, now this 70s, drum sound would likely be recorded not onto a door and a hard drive but onto a magnetic tape. So what I'm going to add now is some tiny bit of 15 inch tape hiss into the signal. Just to fill in the spaces in between and that's just another artifact that would be present in this kind of sound. Up next this track would have been cut onto vinyl and to simulate that I'm going to use this uh, beautiful plugin by Waves, um, the Abbey Road Vinyl, um, which is basically a simulation of a, yeah, a vinyl cutting machine, which lets you add some beautiful uh, yeah, details here as well, as for example this crackle and these little clicks and pops here, which are a little louder. Now let's listen to the drum loop again, going through it. Uh, 
I'm adding another bit of saturation here by just turning up the input and adding a bit of drive here. And as you can see down below here, we have another pitch uh, modulation effectively. Yeah, This is simulating the wow and flutter uh, effect on a vinyl player uh, because the vinyl record player would also not uh, run at perfectly the exact same speed all the time. So we have this little fluctuation. And then if you would sample it from a vinyl record, you would play it back again and there would be another fluctuation effectively. All right, lovely. But I think the crackle and clicks, they're not enough for me, so I'm gonna add additional noise and wear and tear from the RC20 here again. And now I'm gonna make everything mono, because I think the RC20 noise is actually stereo. So I'm gonna use a utility and just grab the left signal because uh, if you were sampling a breakbeat in the 90s with like an MPC or something like this, what you would usually do is that you would take only the left or only the right signal from the stereo because the mixes of the 70s productions, they would usually have the drums louder on one side. And that's the side you would pick to sample. So now we have our mono signal and we can resample it with a lot of noise and hiss and saturation. Now let's listen to the recording. Absolutely beautiful. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually first turn off the warp and then uh, pitch it down and see what happens. It's likely gonna become darker because there's gonna be less high frequencies. And obviously we're gonna hear a bit more of the details in between the drums. and everything's gonna be darker and more moody. And now I wanna add some compression because all these tiny details after the transients, like this almost harmonic content, um, there's actually a lot of uh, yeah, rich textures that you can push up with the compressor. So what I'm gonna do is take a compressor with some very radical settings here. I'm not gonna let the transients through, so very short attack. And I wanna push everything else up, besides from the transients, which are gonna be pushed down. And now I have the signal, and this is just the part I wanna add. This is the dry signal. So I'm gonna now subtly put this into the mix. Yeah, which just brings up a lot of these tiny details and makes everything more melodic almost. And now another compressor. Which is effectively just, yeah, compressing everything uh, a bit to have everything at a more equal volume because afterwards if you would use it in trip hop production you would likely slice it and then add envelopes to the individual slices so uh, yeah you can basically carve out the actual uh, uh, envelope of the sound later so everything is at a more equal volume all right i guess that's it for this little drum loop example here um, obviously you can use any of these specific techniques that i was showing you but it's not really the point i was trying to make um, I was just showing you how you could approach it. Yeah, you hear something on a record that you like, think about what went into it. Is it uh, an original recording? Is it a sample? If yes, what was the original production process of the source sample? Uh, what were the technologies of the time and what were the quirks of these technologies? And I don't know what aesthetic you are going for, but chances are someone produced it in some way with some technology, with some 
quirks and you can actually find out uh, just by researching, reading interviews by artists and engineers and um, if you're willing to invest the time you're going to actually figure out a lot of tiny details that can add up to uh, the aesthetic that you're going for. Up next, let's talk a little bit about tape because obviously you don't have to rely on software but you can actually use the real deal at varying price points. The easiest and most affordable of which would be these classic standard cassette tapes. Um, I think this recorder would be somewhere at around 10 to 20 bucks and these tapes at 2 to 10 bucks on eBay uh, depending on how lucky you are. But make sure to look out for type 2 high position tape because usually this is the better quality than the type 1 cassettes. Um, I personally use this for processing individual groups uh, or individual stems um, like drum machines or uh, I don't know a synth or something recorded onto tape for the saturation, uh, maybe pitch it up or down um, to get the lo-fi kind of effect on individual stems. But if I want to record an entire track and want to retain some of that high fidelity and uh, all the details in the mix down, something like a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, recorder is uh, more useful. Why does it have better quality? Actually, the two have the exact same technology. It's magnetized tape running over a tape head uh, in both machines. And uh, the only difference is that uh, there's more tape going over the tape head in a shorter amount of time uh, in the reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And you can achieve that in two ways. Either you go wider or you move the tape faster. And uh, yeah, the reel-to-reel -reel recorder here compared to the cassette does both. That's why it has a higher quality. And believe it or not, uh, these reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, they are actually still being manufactured brand new and you can actually get them on Toman by a company called Recording the Masters. And this specific tape uh, is called LPR35, which is somewhat of the standard at the moment. So uh, once you get into these higher-end machines, most of them will be uh, yeah, calibrated to the LPR35 tape for ideal quality. All right, up next, why don't we go ahead and listen to some examples. First, I'm gonna be uh, running some individual sounds through the cassette tape, where we're gonna hear an obvious lo-fi effect, uh, some compression and a lot of saturation and drive. And afterwards, I'm actually gonna run an entire track through the Revox, and then we're gonna hear a lot less uh, lo-fi aesthetic because it's actually quite high fidelity, but we're still gonna hear some subtle glue and saturation and compression. So put on your headphones because the differences might be subtle. So let's go. Here we are with my beloved Prophet Rev 2 with which I'm going to show you how to apply some of these principles of 
imperfection and instability and uh, random fluctuation, how to apply these to the synthesis process. So we can already bake it into the sound before we even use effects. Uh, but before we start, let's first think about what would an organic and rich uh, synthesizer sound like and obviously we would think about something like a Yamaha CS80 yeah the most rich and organic and desirable 70s polysynth ever uh, so what would happen if we would press a note would it sound like this no it wouldn't because if you have a look at the tuner what we have here is a perfectly stable not fluctuating at all perfectly stable oscillator um, and it also tracks perfectly across all of the um, all of the octaves a Yamaha CS80 for example it would have fluctuation uh, every single note you would hit would be a tiny bit off on a per voice basis and also on a per voice per oscillator basis so if you were for example to play this chord on a Yamaha CS80 it wouldn't sound like this which is super static and boring, but actually the filter, the filter envelope, the attack, the decay, the sustain, the release, the pitch per oscillator, per voice, everything would vary a tiny bit, which is very organic and very uh, natural sounding. And this is something uh, that would, wouldn't just happen to you when you press a note or a chord on a, a, a contemporary synth like this, where everything is perfectly stable and precise. And why is it like that? I guess uh, back in the days it wasn't, it wasn't that easy to create a perfectly stable oscillator, but now we have the luxury. Uh, but if we wanted to uh, yeah, create some of these fluctuations, for example, the gated sequencer here in the Prophet uh, is a beautiful tool to do so, because what is a gated sequencer? Um, this is a sequencer that doesn't contain any notes, but it contains parameters. Uh, so, for example, I could, yeah, I, I haven't right now, but I could, for example, program the cutoff to be like this when I press it, and the next step in the sequencer, I could have the cutoff like this, and another step could have the cutoff like this. So, you can program parameters in here. Um, I already prepared on patch 64 some parameters. So, now whenever I hit a note, this gated sequencer is going to move one step forward just by pressing a note the sequencer is advanced and it does isn't tied to any sort of clock or whatever you just press a note the sequencer moves to the next parameter and if you now have a look at the tuner whenever i press a note the gated sequencer goes one step further and what i've programmed there is a tiny pitch alteration You don't have to understand how the gated sequencer works exactly, but if you are interested in it, um, I'm going to link a video in the description where I learned it from, and it's going to sound a little bit like rocket science for the first 30 minutes, but the guy in the video, he uh, really went super deep into the behavior of vintage synthesizers and how to create these characteristics in some other uh, contemporary synths as well, so definitely check out his channel. Anyways, uh, I have this sequencer set to key mode, which means the sequencer is advanced one step whenever I hit a note. There's various sequences in the sequencer at once. Uh, here is the fourth sequence and this one is controlling, for example, the decay amount of all the envelopes. So these three here. And these are the individual steps and their values. Yeah, so the first step has a value of four for the, all the decays. Next one has a value of one, value of eight, value of zero. So this one has exactly this decay setting, uh, etc. So these are just tiny alterations that are now going to happen on a per voice basis. Um, because whenever I hit a new note, it's actually going to be a different voice. So even if I hit two notes at once, this note is going to be having a tiny bit different values than this note. Yeah, Tiny bit different pitch, tiny bit different decay, etc. And if we now add a second oscillator for which I have programmed individual pitch fluctuations and uh, envelope fluctuations and mix them by 
This is one oscillator, this is another. And now they're gonna be tiny bit off individually in a different way whenever I hit a new voice. Yeah, and this is obviously beautiful when I start to press a chord. And if we now add uh, some effects, like for example, RC20 with the following settings here that I prepared already, a lot of bit crush and wobble and if, uh, yeah, also some reverb and noise and all these artifacts, it's gonna sound something like this. Now let's add some more envelope settings here, so that I don't have to keep moving the filter. Beautiful. And now one other thing that I could do is I could use the aftertouch functionality. It's called pressure here. And I could use it to modulate something. For example, this knob, uh, which is called oscillator slop, which effectively just uh, makes the oscillator yeah, be even more imprecise. Um, but the unfortunate thing about this uh, feature here is that it only works uh, for all of the voices at the same time globally. So this is what it does, which is a beautiful fluctuation and instability. But unfortunately, it affects all of the voices at the same time in the same way. Um, so it's not as advanced as the gated sequencer technique, but we can uh, use it uh, to map it on uh, uh, aftertouch, like this. And now, whenever I uh, put additional pressure on the key after I pressed it, I can create this uh, lovely uh, detuned effect while I'm playing the synth. So now let me start this MIDI pattern here and see how this chord progression sounds like. And now one more thing that I can add on top uh, to make it more, yeah, wider in the stereo sense uh, is to use Micro Shift by Sound Toys, which is a, a beautiful effect. It just creates tiny uh, pitch shifts on a micro uh, level on the left and right side of the signal, uh, which, yeah, just has this widening effect, which you hear in a lot of productions, especially when it comes to certain pads to make them wider in the mix. So let's have a little A-B. It's a subtle difference, but without it, the sound is more in the middle, and when I turn it on, it's going to be more stereo. Now let's add in some noise here from the noise oscillator, I almost forgot. You get the idea. So I could spend like upwards of another hour on this synth, um, just adding these additional modulations to create even more tiny imperfections. And while all of them are very subtle, when they add up, you get something like this, which is just super beautiful. Next, I'm going to check out Massive to see uh, what we can do uh, even without a gated sequencer, just with LFOs, uh, because a lot of you are not going to have access to something like this. Um, and afterwards, I'm going to show you how I would approach this on a mono synth, like for example, my Moog grandmother, because there's also a bunch of possibilities where you can create these instabilities and fluctuations. All right, now we are here in Massive by Native Instruments, which is one of my favorite soft synths. Of course, you could use any synth that you like. Uh, because we're basically just going to use LFOs and envelopes for this. So 
Um, this is also going to work without a gated sequencer or anything uh, like this. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn this. Into this. And uh, it's actually not going to be that difficult. So the very first thing that we need is a filter, obviously. Low pass filter. And uh, this might con look confusing at first here, but it's actually super simple. You have here envelopes and you have LFOs and you could, can just drag and drop them wherever you like. So we can, for example, take envelope one and put it on the filter and this is now our amount here, yeah? So now this envelope is gonna control the filter. Yeah, here we have an oscillator section, here we have a filter section, here we have some effects, that's it. Super easy actually. Uh, so, now we have a little envelope on the filter. This is already assigned to our amp envelope. And now what we can do is we can use these LFOs here uh, to create subtle fluctuation. We have LFO5 and LFO6 here. Uh, first let's set the rate to be fairly low and now we have on top of the envelope we have a slight inconsistency on the filter it's going to be moving slightly now what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to take lfo6 and modulate the rate of lfo5 so now even the rate of this movement is not going to be steady and i'm going to do the same thing vice versa and modulate the rate of lfo6 with lfo5 boom infinite variation, even though it's just on a very tiny scale. Now I'm going to apply a tiny envelope to the resonance. And I might also take our filter envelope here and even modulate the attack a tiny bit with an LFO and maybe also the decay. And now suddenly we have fluctuation there as well. Now what we have here is just uh, an oscillator playing a mixture between a square wave and a saw wave and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take an LFO and create some fluctuation here as well when it comes to the pitch and I'm going to add a second uh, oscillator this one's going to be tuned up by a fifth that has nothing to do with the vintage sound design that's just how I composed these notes because I had it on a profit as well. It's just uh, basically part of the chord progression to have uh, every note plus its fifth. That's why I have the second oscillator tuned up by seven. Um, now I'm going to take another LFO and modulate this oscillator as well. Now both oscillators are fluctuating in their pitch on a very tiny scale. And in a very complex manner because these LFOs are not constant, they are actually changing. And already we hear this tiny wobbling in the, uh, in the pitch. And actually I'm going to turn both LFOs a bit more down because I want the movement to be not so noticeable and very slow and subtle. Alright, up next what could we uh, make unsteady and unstable? For example this position here which basically switches between the waveforms this should also subtly vary on both of them and we could actually take this slider and send the sound not just through one filter but actually through another filter as well which has a different envelope amount and curve so obviously some subtle modulation. On both the resonance and the filter frequency. Now already we have on a very subtle tiny scale 
basically infinite tiny variation. Now let's also add uh, some noise in here, also with an envelope. And what else could we do? We could take an LFO and modulate the uh, ratio between the different filters. Yeah? And I guess by now you get the idea. What I'm doing is I'm not creating super noticeable movements, but I'm creating subtle tiny instabilities and fluctuations. Um, and also because I have a positive and negative uh, option here on these LFOs to use them either as a negative signal or as a positive signal and of course with different amounts. All of these modulations are a tiny bit different. This one is negative as opposed to this one being positive and this one is stronger and uh, the LFOs constantly change because they are modulating each other and all of this is so subtle that you wouldn't really even notice it. You would, everything that you notice is that the sound is more rich and more organic than uh, yeah, it was before, obviously. So now let's add our same preset that I created here for RC20 again and MicroShift. This is the exact same chain I used on the Prophet. And now watch what happens. Yeah, beautiful. So here's the proof. You don't need a gated sequencer. If you have a vision in mind um, and you put in the extra uh, yeah, attention into the details, you can achieve a really beautiful organic sound with software as well. Here we are with my Moog grandmother to have a look at how we could apply some of these principles to monosynths. Uh, and here we have obviously much more limited capabilities uh, than on the Prophet or the uh, Massive VST. Uh, and I'm actually only going to use this one patch cable. But first let's start with the oscillator, which uh, in this case the first one is just a triangle. Uh, and the sound that I'm going for is like a, a yeah, melodic lead sound that you can perform um, that sounds almost like a string instrument or a flute or something like that. Um, so this is our triangle wave and as you might notice it's already being distorted because on the Moog itself it starts to saturate from around this volume. But what you're hearing is also the Echoplex preamp guitar pedal. This is taken from the old school Echoplex tape delay unit, which a lot of guitar players used just for its uh, built-in preamp. What this does is also just super subtle saturation uh, by and boosting the signal a bit. And then it goes into the analog heat. And from the analog heat, it goes into my Mackie desk, which is also distorting it. So I have four uh, layers of tiny, subtle saturation already, giving us yeah, a very complex array of overtones that also change when I turn the filter. There's some beautiful interplay. Up next, let's add a second oscillator. This is a saw wave, which on its own already has more overtones. So I'm going to use it more quietly. And what I'm going to do, if you have a look at the uh, tuner, they are all perfectly stable right now. Uh, so to already get some movement in there, I want them to actually be a tiny bit out of tune. They actually already are. So here I have the tuning for the second oscillator. And the more out of tune they are, they start to wobble like this. And when they are in tune, there's no movement, but I want some subtle movement. very slow. This is, you need a lot of attention to detail here. Now it's moving very slowly and they are going in and out of sync basically. And the higher the note is that I play, the faster this movement is going to get. So if I go one octave up, the movement that we perceive um, is going to be twice as fast. So here it's fairly fast and now here it should be half the speed. Yeah. 
exactly. But now I'm gonna use the second oscillator more subtly, just like this. All right, up next I'm gonna use my one patch cable as I already mentioned, and I'm actually gonna take the signal from the key uh, board out. What does this mean? Uh, this actually yeah, produces, produces a CV signal. Um, that is higher, the higher I go on the notes. You would usually use this for keyboard tracking for the filter. So the higher note you play, um, the more open the filter is. Uh, but we can also grab the signal from here and put it into the modulation section. And I'm putting it into the rate in, meaning it is going to change the rate of our LFO depending on how high the note is that we play. So let me show it to you in an exaggerated fashion with the cutoff. So now, the filter is closed and the lower the note is, the slower the LFO is going to move the filter. And the higher the note, the faster the filter is going to wobble. And even faster. You get the idea. So I'm also going to use this, but in a very subtle fashion, just, just like this. So now whenever I press a note, it's going to be moving. It's going to be wobbling because of the detuning of the oscillators and it's going to be filtered up and down because of the LFO and the rate of it is not going to be steady but it's going to depend on um, which note I press. So every note has its own rhythm now. All right, so up next let's add some noise to make it even grittier with the noise oscillator. So now, whenever the filter opens, we hear some additional texture and grit. And if I fil uh, open the filter back up again, we can look at the tuner and see that the pitch is still fairly steady. So what we can do is we can actually also use the pitch modulation here. Also just very subtly, as you can see now on the tuner. This is also requiring some careful attention here, not to overdo it. All right, now we have some pitch instability. And because of the keyboard tracking, which is clocking this whole, uh, yeah, the rate or controlling the rate of this whole modulation oscillator, the pitch modulation is also going to be faster or slower depending on the keyboard tracking. So now every note is uh, very unique, not just by pitch, but also by yeah, its own rhythm and all these subtle uh, little changes. And of course, because of the uh, distortion that is happening after the uh, output, um, we have a lot of complex interplay with the filter. Because depending where the filter is at, the distortion is going to differ and create different harmonics. And now uh, to create some additional, yeah, dreamlike, nostalgic uh, kind of sound, we can uh, utilize the spring reverb, which is also obviously a vintage aesthetic um, that you are used to from hearing uh, it on, yeah, a lot of old records. Uh, but it's back in fashion actually. So there's a metal spring somewhere inside of the synth, I think down here. Actually, if you shake the synth, you can hear it. Yeah, that's a spring in there. The sound is going through it and uh, yeah, creating this old school analog reverb effect, which sounds very lovely. Yeah, so there you go. And as I already said multiple times, it's not about the tools that you have. Uh, as I think I have now demonstrated, Pretty much any tool will give you some possibilities to apply these principles and create subtle imperfections and instabilities that will yeah, drastically enhance the organicness, is that a word, organicness, of your sounds. 
as long as you understand the basic principles. Now let's try and hear it in a musical context. this little jam recorded onto cassette with this beautiful machine which uh, I admitted I bought this off of eBay for a hundred bucks after I recorded the tape segment of this video but I still wanted to include it because it's so beautiful and fairly affordable actually this is uh, I think from 1991 which is about where cassette technology peaked basically and this is like a super advanced machine uh, which you can get in beautiful conditions for about 100 euros and um, what you should look out for is a three head model, meaning there's an individual erase head, write head and read head, allowing us to monitor the tape while it's being recorded. So this is why we can actually take this and use it as an external audio effect in Ableton, for example. So we can send something in here and with about a millisecond delay, we can record it back into Ableton um, after it went through the tape, which is beautiful. So that's what I'm about to do now. Take a Type 2 cassette, put it in here and it actually, it's very fancy, it automatically recognizes what kind of tape you put in there. Um, now let's send the recording of the jam in there. Now we are still listening to the source. So I will now start the tape and record. And now we can do what's in Germany called Hinterbandkontrolle which is basically just tape monitoring, after tape monitoring. So after it's going through the tape, it sounds like this. So yeah, this one sparks a lot of joy for sure. Uh, and yeah, these types of tape decks uh, aimed at audiophile uh, customers from the 90s uh, are actually a potential great alternative for music production um, to the typical Tascam type 4-track recorders uh, because I personally don't really use the um, multi-track recording um, on my 4-tracker so I decided to get one of these because I would just do mono and stereo recording anyways and this is a more affordable, higher quality and much more beautiful alternative. Definitely look out for these in your local thrift shops and on eBay. I guess that's it from my side for today and as I already said uh, this is not a comprehensive list by any means just my personal favorites that I've discovered over the years so if you have any tips of your own feel free to uh, share them in the comments for sure looking forward to hearing them uh, and apart from that thanks for tuning in see you next time peace out mm -hmm.